What's up, friends? Welcome back to Rooted Wisconsin, where we are dedicated to authentically sharing the stories of the people that make Wisconsin a great place to be. Start this episode off the same way we start every episode, by thanking you. Thank you for watching. Thank you for liking. Thank you for subscribing and following on YouTube and Spotify, wherever you take it in. We really appreciate you. We wouldn't be here without you. Um, Heading coming up on a year of Rude to Wisconsin, and it's been a fantastic time growing faster than we ever thought it would, and that's because of you. So we appreciate you. Thanks for being here. Getting into another show, a couple exciting announcements before we uh, get started with our guests today. Uh, one, uh, just a quick thank you. This isn't uh, so exciting now, but a quick thank you to the folks at Discover Green Bay. We're in our new studio again today and uh, happy to have worked out a partnership with them to, to get some studio space. And a bigger, fresher announcement today is that we have partnered with Riverside Pizzeria in Green Bay. Uh, really happy. A couple episodes ago, you got to uh, kind of learn Ryan Rizzacone's story about how, bringing that famous pizza to Wisconsin and everything that went into that and some of his story. And that's led to us uh, continuing to chat a little bit and Riverside B Pizzeria being a sponsor of Rooted Wisconsin. So really excited about that. Uh, great local organization and fantastic pizza. Uh, my wife and I used to joke, we live in Ashwaubenon where Riverside is now in Green Bay. And we always joked that we lived in such a busy spot, we were surprised that we didn't have a pizza that we loved really close. And when we heard Riverside were coming, we were really excited and just couldn't be happier to how it evolved. And now um, a great partnership with an awesome local business. Ryan uh, shared in his episode of Rooted Wisconsin that they're going to be hoping to grow to a few different geographic locations in Wisconsin. So the fit couldn't be better and really excited about the partnership. So um, all in all, just a big thanks to Ryan and his team for putting their faith in us and uh, enjoying what we do as much as we enjoy their pizzas. So that's our big news for the day as we get started with another episode of Rooted Wisconsin. And that brings us into our guest today, Caitlin Kronoski. Thank you for joining us, Caitlin. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's awesome. I, I, the, the uniform might give it away, but <laughs> conservation officer in or conservation warden for the Wisconsin DNR. I'll mess that up 32 times today, so uh, you might as well just say your actual title. Is it conservation warden? Yeah, yep, I'm a conservation warden and um, work with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. Yeah, how long have you been doing it? Let's start there. Yeah, so I've been doing this job for, um, well, Got hired in 2012 full time, so I've um, been doing it for a, a pretty good long period of time. And then prior to getting hired full time as a warden, um, I had the opportunity to work um, part time as a deputy warden and mainly working with aquatic invasive species, which really helped me get to the point where I wanted to be in my full time career here once I got hired. So, yeah. Well, it's, uh, how do, like, uh, I always wondered this how do, like, what's your geographic area and how do geographic areas work? For wardens, yeah, it's kind of um, it's kind of unique. So um, specifically, my geographic area I cover um, I cover the eastern half of Wapaka County. So I have um, kind of my main cities or areas is New London, Manoa, Clintonville, Marion, and Barris um, are my bigger cities. Um, and depending on the time of the year, one can be more busy than the other. And then for me specifically, um, there's another two wardens that share counties with me. So there's a Another warden that covers the western half of Wapaka County, and then we have another guy who covers part of the southern half, but then also has um, townships into Washera County. So um, each warden station is kind of unique, um, depending where you go. Um, some stations may, like one, uh, some counties may have just one warden. It might be split up two ways, and maybe it's split down the middle. Maybe it's split north and south. Um, it just kind of depends on the area, kind of the priorities, and kind of what's going on in that station and where the workload is. So really each county is um, is different based on how it's staffed or how it's split by a warden. So. Yeah, probably somewhat by need, quote unquote need per se, or population, something. Yep, I think they certainly, when they drew those lines, probably took that into account in yeah. some way, shape, or form based on populations and even like you think waterways or um, where there's heavy, heavy traffic for fishing, hunting, whatever it may be. So I think when they, when they made those maps originally, they really took that into account on where they need to have the priorities at. Yeah. Yeah. So, so 
uh, great like foundation. We we like to start at the beginning. So, um, what, uh, how, like, what, what led you to this being your career? Kind of, I, I know you mentioned some passion around aquatic invasive species. There has the outdoors been central to your life. Is that kind of a starting spot? Yeah, I would say um, growing up, um, my family was into the outdoors. Um, so. Um, when I was young, I did a lot of time, uh, or I spent a lot of time fishing. Um, that was something I really enjoyed, um, just being outdoors in general, um, snowmobiling and things like that. And when I was growing up, um, I knew I wanted to be in law enforcement and um, just didn't really know kind of, you know, where I wanted to be or what particular role um, I wanted to be in. And um for me, there's a lot of wardens that knew they were going to be, they wanted to be a warden since they were a little kid. But for me, I actually kind of found it later in life. Um, so I went to college um, over at St. Cloud State University. Um, I went for a, a bachelor's degree in criminal justice. And um, once again, still knew I wanted to do the law enforcement um, work, but just was still, I didn't know if I wanted to, which route I wanted to go. Um, but fortunately, um, my junior year of college, um, I went to a career fair um, that was just geared towards law enforcement. So they had a lot of different agencies come to their, to come to that event. And um, fortunately, uh, Minnesota Department of Natural Resources was there. And um, I really got to speak with uh, one of their recruiters and um, really kind of got to learn the ins and the outs of um, what a warden does on a daily basis. And I'm like, this sounds like a great career. Like, You combine law enforcement, which I wanted to do, and then, of course, my passion for the outdoors, hunting, fishing, um, snowmobiling. I'm like, eh, this sounds like a great great path. So um, my junior year, I really, once I learned that, I really focused my um, studies and passions, career passions around that career. And um, fortunately, I was able to get an internship with the Wisconsin DNR for a semester long, so I was able to earn credit and then... um, work as an intern and then uh, gain credit and in the same sense get a lot of um, experience and um, I can say that through that internship that was aside from uh, uh, talking with that recruiter um, that internship really uh, drove home for me that this is what I'd like to do so I eventually graduated from college and then um, once I got out of college um, I think I'd mentioned earlier that I started off part-time with the department, and that's where I worked uh, for two seasons or summers um, with aquatic invasive species, and then was able to get a lot of experience just in the department and um, learn kind of how wardens work and and whatnot. So I was able to get a lot of experience, which helped me get to where I am today. So that's how I got to be where I am. A little bit different path than maybe what some of our wardens take, because like I said, a lot of people know at a real young age, that's what they want to do. But for me, I learned a little little later in life, which it all worked out. So <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, well, oftentimes exposure points us in directions, right? I, yep. And that's a great thing. And sometimes it points us away from, from directions too. Exactly, you know? exactly. Yeah. Well, and probably topical because I know um, we were talking offline that uh, you're going to be looking for some officers. Topical maybe to some listeners. What Even just law enforcement in general, what do you remember as some of the things that drew you to the career? Yeah. So for me, the things that drew me to the career, obviously the law enforcement side, the, you know, helping people, um, being there to, you know, protect citizens um, in the community, community communities I would serve. And then once I got in more passionate about the natural resources end of it, um, I just really wanted to ensure that you know, people are safe. And then of course that there's enough, um, fish and game for futures. So, you know, we think about our generation and, you know, generations behind us where there's going to be, you know, hopefully enough, um, wild game and things for people to engage in, you know, that are, that are, you know, about yay high now. Uh And, you know, in about 20 years or 15 years, um, I, I hope that through my work, I can help preserve that and keep that opportunity there for, um, future generations to enjoy just like I have and you have and probably some of the lif- listeners on the show too so yeah yeah absolutely and um, I think uh, I, talking through a, to a few uh, conservation wardens throughout my life I think that's a resonating 
thing that um, a lot of times your immediate thought, at least to me from an outside looking in, your immediate thought is that it's that passion with the outdoors that people do it. Mm-hmm. But oftentimes I've noticed that's uh, even equaled or a lot of times uh, even greater about the support of people in the outdoors. Right. And I think that's a pretty common theme about wanting to get into your type of field. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. And it's it's really nice um, to have the support of the community. Um, you know, I get to, being in my, I've been in New London for, I got stationed there. Um, I transferred there in 2014, so I've been there for, gosh, almost 10 years now. So I've really gotten to know the community and just, you know, the different sportsmen's groups and different groups. Um, so it's really kind of nice when you've been into an area for a while and you just kind of build those connections with with the community and people feel comfortable calling you, you know, if they see something or even just a general question. Um, and, you know, I just did a, a learn to turkey hunt where I went and talked about rules with um, kids that are learning to turkey hunt for the first time. So we have kind of a wide variety of things we do. A lot of people, when they look at a warden or think of a warden, the first thing that comes to most people's mind is law enforcement, which mm-hmm. is a very key part and a big chunk of what we do. But there's a lot of stuff on the outside too, um, that we do in our communities and um, a lot of public relations type work and um, just getting involved with community events and things like that. So um, it's kind of neat to have that wide variety of things we do versus just the one, you know, law enforcement is what a lot of people think of when they think of a conservation warden. Yeah. uh, Kind of something in there was one thing I thought about chatting today uh, that I'm interested to learn about is that the relationship with, the public. I th- that's a really important part of your job because um, like talking about your area, I think it's important that that trust is built that someone calls you, right? Because right. few and far between are you going to just happen upon somebody that's doing something incorrect. I'm sure it happens, but right. like I'm sure you lean on the public to in kind of self-enforce what's right and wrong or the laws. And what, how would uh, like, you talked about how you built that relationship, but how would um, how would you describe that? Is it is it a place where the you know the vast majority of the public you feel is a collaborative, uh, accepting relationship with what you do? Yeah, I would say so. Um, I I think we get a lot of support from our communities, and I think a lot of that comes from just like I mentioned before, building those connections. And like you had mentioned, um, you know, we do happen and or stumble into stuff um, where people are. are not following the rules or doing something wrong. But a lot of times we receive calls um, from the community. So, you know, when you think about it, um, I cover the eastern half of Wapaka County, and it doesn't seem like a lot, but it's actually a pretty big a pretty big chunk when you really kind of look at it and you look at the seasons. And there's one of me, and there's, I don't know how many people that live in that, but thousands of people. So um, I depend a lot of time on, you know, other people seeing things and calling Um there's a lot more eyes in the community that, you know, see things happen where I can, only, I'm only one person. I wish, I wish there was a hundred of me, um, but uh, I can only be, you know, in so many spots and places. So um, to be successful, I do rely a lot on community input and, and support. So, and um, I think it's a key piece of, um, of this job, yeah. building those connections. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and success in the role, I would think, because I'm sure there's been scenarios where, uh, you know, it, it, it's it's a two-way street, right? Like it, it, if you don't build the connection or maybe go the opposite way, then it's probably harder to be successful in your role because, because those aren't made. Right, yeah, definitely the connections make can make a warden successful. And when I, I first got hired, I, I was actually stationed in Milwaukee County. And then, so I was there from 2012 to about 2014. So, um little over a little under a year or so after training but um you know that's a very big area versus where I am now in New London it's a smaller so it's a little bit easier to make those connections and then I was in Milwaukee County for a short time so I started to make those connections and then transferred and kind of had to start over um and meet new groups and new people in the community and um and it just takes time and you know it's Building that support is, um, I say, a career-long um, investment. Um, you have to constantly garner and build that support among amongst people in your community. Yeah, absolutely. 
So you mentioned fishing earlier. Do you, and I, I've heard from other wardens that that's um, at least early career. Everybody's into the outdoors, right? So at different <laughs> times of the year, maybe you don't get to do the things that you used to love to do. If it's especially if it's a popular thing like opening weekend of deer season or something. Yep. Do you still find time and still enjoy recreating and fishing? I do. Yeah. Um, I'm really passionate about. I, I really love fishing, but my true passion is upland bird hunting. Okay. Um. So I definitely find time to do both of those. Um, kind of the fortunate thing um, about this job is, yeah, you, you may miss some of the openers. Like you might be, you might have to work the opening weekend of gun deer season, or you might have to work um, the opening weekend of waterfowl hunting. Um, but the nice thing is, is you can still find time to go out um, around those openers, um, which was really, <laughs> really key because that's, you know, it's something I like to do and you don't want to just stop doing something because, you know, you don't have time. And, and to be quite frankly, or frank, that's a question I get a lot from people that have an interest in this career. They're like, Hey, I really enjoy hunting and fishing. And that's not something I want to not be able to do or only to be able to do a small amount. And, um, I always tell people you, you can find time to do that stuff. Um, you know, obviously you do your work and you have to work those priority or those important weekends or openers. But outside of that, there's plenty of time to find, to get out and get out and do those things you love. And, um, we're pretty fortunate with, uh, with our agency. Um, they promote work-life balance. So they want to ensure that people are, you know, doing things with family, um, getting out and doing the things they're passionate about. And, um, of course, you know, not lose that stuff you like to do because a lot of times you can you get so caught up in something you know you get busy and you know a lot of things get put on the back burner and um it's always important to make sure you keep those things you enjoy on up there too (laughs) so yeah I do quite a bit of it so I try to anyway I mean even if if your shift just happens to end and you're out in the field (laughs) I mean you can plan around a little time and and at the end of your shift so upland bird hunting what uh, uh, pheasants what what do you like to do yeah so um pretty much any upland bird um I I like pheasants um I really enjoy more close local is woodcock and grouse hunting in northern Wisconsin um I take uh I try to take a couple trips out west um for up, up or sharp tailed grouse. Um, I've went out west for sage grouse. Um, quail is a big one that I really, really enjoy doing. Um, I actually have a um, bucket list to um, hunt and harvest all six quail species that are native to um, the U.S. So I'm at four out of six species. So I have two more to go and hopefully can get those done in the next couple, next couple of years. But uh, those last two are going to be a drive um, over to the to the west western part of the United States. So um, I have uh, a small monster lander pointer and a, um, a golden retriever flushing dog that I hunt with. So um, between me and the dogs, we've put on a lot of miles uh, chasing around upland birds. So nice. <laughs> it's something I really enjoy doing and passionate about. So yeah, when I when I found out you were going to be on the show, I, I think. Um I think I was doing some research, and I think one of your social media pictures is you and your golden retriever. Yeah, I, yep, I believe. yep, yep. That's that's kind of unique, right? To, for a golden retriever to be a flushing dog, that's a, that's a little unique, isn't it? Um, no, they're pretty much known for a lot. Of, a lot of people use um, retrievers for a lot of people think waterfowl. Yeah. Um, but there's actually quite a few people that use them for um, upland birds too, like pheasants. Yeah, and pheasants I've seen. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. For whatever reason, um, golden retrievers and pheasants seem to be um, kind of connected for whatever reason. Yeah. Um, but I've taken teal on every uh, upland species I've hunted, and she's had the whole gamut: pheasant, quail, various types of quail, and um, the different different upland grouse species, and then of course pheasant, woodcock, and grouse. So. Um, she loves bird probably more than I do. And, uh, <laughs> which is kind of funny to say. And, um, so we put on a lot of miles chasing those around and, and to be honest, she doesn't care if it's uh if she's retrieving and flushing a grouse or it's a quail, she likes them all equally. So she just, she, once you kind of grab that collar and grab your shotgun, she, she knows what's going on and she knows that it's, uh, it's time to go have fun. So <laughs> yeah, if that's been her whole life. That's yep. what she lives for. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's on the, that stuff's on the fringe for me. I wish I, I wish I knew a little bit more. I have a blast doing it every time I do, yep. but I, I'm nowhere near an expert on it. I've, I've pheasant hunted a few times, sure. uh, grouse hunted 
several times. Never, I, uh, there's something beautiful about a dog doing it. And, uh, yep. I had a, I had a chocolate lab that liked to grouse hunting with me, but he liked riding in the truck to get there and then running around <laughs> the woods. You know, he wasn't, <laughs> he wasn't afraid <laughs> to do it. So th- that's on the fringe for me, but I, the, the appeal is certain, right? Like there's a, and they taste so delicious too. Like, right. Yep. Yeah, well, definitely. You got a, you have a go-to bird recipe that you like? Um, I do. Um, it's actually relatively simple. Um, I usually just take like pheasants or grouse or any game bird for that matter, but pheasant and grouse seem to be my favorite and fajitas. Fajitas? <laughs> fajitas, okay. yeah. That's my kind of go to. Um okay. but other other than that you can subs I usually substitute um like especially grouse and pheasant, um anything you could for chicken. So if I make a meal with that would call for chicken, I usually just sub substitute grouse or pheasant and place that in instead. So Yeah. Yeah, it's delicious. <laughs> oh, it, it really is. I uh one of my favorite things to do with grouse whenever I got them was kind of parboil them and then uh put a nice breading and make like grouse nugget type things like it, really like good. grouse tender. Yeah. Yep. And it's super easy and they're phenomenal. And of course, pheasant is delicious. Yeah, so. exactly. Exactly. So what are the, uh, what are the two types? It was quail that you said have left on your list. What are the two types you don't have yet? Yeah. So the last two species I have to harvest are the valley quail and the mountain quail. So the mountain quail is, um, it, well, in the mountains of, California is kind of their prime uh, location. And then valley quail are kind of in a similar area. Um, They can be found in like Oregon, um, those western states that are going to require a very long drive for me. (laughs) Uh Yeah. So. A long drive, but beautiful country. I I love it out there. Like the rural parts of, uh, I mean, when I think of mountain California, I know that it goes a long way down, but I love northern California. Yeah, Uh, northern, yeah, beautiful beautiful area so yep. that'll be a fun bucket list item to check off when yeah, you get there yeah i'm looking forward to it i uh my probably my two probably my two favorite spots that i've been uh, my hunted uh, desert quail down in arizona beautiful country and then of course i was down there in january so the weather's beautiful and i got to escape the uh snow and cold that we have here um so i really really enjoyed that long drive but just really pretty um beautiful country and the weather's nice and um, always a good time to escape the cold. And then probably my second hunt um, behind that was um, sage grouse hunting in Wyoming. Um, once again, just like there's so much, it there's so much land there and it's so vast. It's just it's incredible. Um, it's really cool country. Um, the sage sagebrush and um, you see, you know, aside from the grouse, which is my favorite, you see just a plethora of different animals um antelope i actually saw a couple golden eagles when i was out there which was really neat so um the fun part about those hunting trips of course is the hunting itself but kind of the experiences that come with it and the things you see and then of course the friends along the way are what makes it what makes it the the most fun or enjoyable to me so yeah you mentioned vast in there that's that's one of my favorite feelings being in the outdoors when you're as you're far away from things like Mm -hmm. normal life when you're far away from it i i've never been in rural wyoming um but like when i when you feel that like i mean close to us you can get that feeling even in northern wisconsin or like you can definitely get in the up where you feel a long ways away from things but that feeling is really freeing it Um, is i i yearn for that i had a i had a chance i was fortunate enough to go hunting in alaska um three th- about three years ago and uh I, I never had that feeling like that when I was on Kodiak Island with like a plane that flew me there yep. <laughs> uh, that landed on the water and yep. then when they leave it's like all right like this is I'm here for a while exactly exactly that's an unbelievable feeling and I'm guessing you probably didn't have cell, cell phone signal there either no, and that's kind of some of these real spots too it's kind of nice you know you go to these spots where you know, you're hunting and you don't have any cell phone and it's it's just nice to disconnect from, you know, everything, the social media and just, you know, even if you're, even if you're out hunting, say you're, you hunt six, six hours in a day and you're in a spot where you don't have signal cause it's kind of remote, just that getting away from that phone for six hours and just, you know, you and your dogs and nobody else around in the outdoors. And it's just, there's, there's a, there's something to be said about that. It's, it's a nice feeling. It's fun. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. 
it really makes you think about uh, just like humans in general and, and, you know, how we spend our time on earth and what we were made to be on earth for, you know, it makes you contemplate the existence (laughs) or the relationship between both of those things. Right. Right. But yeah, the, the cell service thing is great. You know, like, like you said, it's even awesome sitting in a deer stand for a while if you don't have cell phone service. Exactly. Exactly. For like that. I mean, it it was, you know, eight or nine days, whatever it was of, of like, it doesn't even pay to turn your phone on because it's not going to work. And I I was fortunate enough to go with my uncle and my cousin. So it was some really awesome time to, together and uh i constantly search for that feeling of vastness right I, that's all i could was screaming at me when you said it exactly no it's uh it's a it's a good feeling that's for sure and it's always it's always nice just to check out new areas too and um for me i like to do it with my dog and a shotgun and yeah that's just how i like to you know explore and spend my time off so yeah yeah. So, and then you mentioned fishing. What what type of fishing do you like to do? Yeah. So I kind of do a variety. Um, I really enjoy my personal favorite is um, is flathead fishing, flathead catfish. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, a lot of my summer is spent um, flathead cat flathead cat fishing, and then along with that comes you know you got to catch bait for them. So pan fishing um, on the river. So a lot of times I'll I'll go before I go flathead cat fishing. I'll go and I got to catch some bait on the river and then, you know, then I go up to my spot and, and whatnot. So I, I really enjoy doing that. I run a set line for, um, catfish and, um, I like to walleye fish too. Um, and I mentioned pan fishing, probably my favorite, but the flathead cat fishing is number one for me. (laughs) And it's kind of unique to the Wolf River in my area. There's, I mean, there's other spots obviously that have flatheads, but, um, they're growing up. Um, I, I did not fish for flatheads or catfish and um so I was when I got to my station I was able to learn a lot about it and like, man, these are really neat fish I mean I have pictures of fish that I'm holding up that their heads here and their tails almost down to my down to my feet so um the biggest one I caught was just over 46 inches so Dang. it's a big fish <laughs> absolutely yeah yeah I didn't I didn't even know you could flathead fish by you yep. um yeah because that was, I mean, obviously we're in Green Bay right now. It's a, you can channel catfish here, but yep. I, I, there's probably flatheads in the Mississippi, I would think. There is, yep. The Mississippi, the Wolf River, um, the Fox River has them. Um, and I think there's some stretches um, of the Wisconsin River that have them as well. Okay. But I primarily just stick close to home on yeah. the Wolf River there. So okay. but maybe one of these days I'll have to venture out somewhere else and chuck out a new piece of water body and, and try to catch a flathead and yeah. explore a new spot. Yeah. Yeah, that's news to me. I didn't I didn't know that. Um that's like, you know, the classic um it, my my experience with catfish is like whatever you would call it, like sinker and a worm on the bottom <laughs> in the river. You know, that's how you get a lot of catfish. Yep, exactly. I didn't, I didn't know the flathead was that prevalent in Wisconsin because yep. flathead's a big southern thing, right? Like right. a lot of people down south catch flatheads, and yep. that's like the noodle. You ever would yeah. have you ever or would you noodle? I haven't, and I'm uh, probably too chicken to stick my hand down <laughs> a dark place where I don't know what's down there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and knowing my luck, though, it would be a really big one. It would grab me and probably take me with it (laughs) so noodling will probably something I won't try but uh probably just stick to the hook and line and set line for me so that seems to be the most effective and whatnot so yeah it's probably it's probably like a proximity thing right but I I see uh I always see on social media there's a couple people that have made noodling pretty popular and I just like there's like I feel like, I guess I'm not the expert, but I feel like there's like water snakes in the South that I don't want to be messing with. And some of those places have to have gators. I would think so, yeah. <laughs> that doesn't sound appealing to me. I, right. I'm, I'm a land dweller by nature anyway. Like I love fishing, but I sure. like being on the bank or the boat. Yep. But um, man, I just don't know. Uh, but I wonder, is, is do you know if that's a thing in Wisconsin? Do people noodle here? <sighs> is th- it in our laws? <laughs> yeah, I think some people do. Um but I don't think it's nearly as predominant like down in the southern regions of the U.S. Um, yeah. I think it occurs, but I I don't think to any like extent that um, that happens down in the south. At least in my area, I can say I don't see a lot of people doing it. So yeah, yeah. Well, that's fascinating. I uh, learn something new every day, and I, d- <laughs> I didn't know that that it was that uh, accessible. Yeah, because they they get huge. That's that's fun fishing. I yeah, they they put up a fight. It's a it's a 
I would say a pretty popular fishery um, on the Wolf River. A lot of people do it both for hook and line and um, running set lines or bank pulls for them. So it's a it's a pretty popular thing on the river. Nice. And that that's probably another thing. I haven't spent a ton of time fishing the wolf, so I don't know a, b- a bunch about it. Right. Pretty it's a it's a pretty thriving fishery though, right? Yeah, for sure. Um especially like right now it's um it's a really busy time, so the walleyes are um currently running, so we have a it's a a lot of people that fish it and um once the walleyes kind of slow down, then sturgeon come up and they spawn. Um we don't have a season on sturgeon, but it's kind of a really unique opportunity. Um, for people to come out and um, watch the sturgeon spawn, as goofy as it sounds, um, we kind of have one of the one of the areas in the U.S. where we have a pretty robust sturgeon population, and um, we have the ability right in our backyard to come and watch them and observe them spawn. Whereas other parts of um, the U.S. and they spawn, but they spawn way at the bottom, um, so you don't really have an opportunity to see them. So we have a pretty unique opportunity here. Um, so once that passes, then uh, we'll get the white bass run, and we'll get a lot of people that come for white bass fishing. So uh, the Wolf River is a pretty popular spot to be right now. Um, and this year it just happened where ice went out very early um, in February. So we've been having people fishing for walleye since uh, in open water since mid February. So it's been um, it's been a pretty busy time and continues to be, and will probably for the next couple months. Um, and then we'll get kind of back more into our summer fishing um, type activities. So uh, it's a busy, busy time for wardens on the Wolf River. <laughs> yeah, you haven't had to break up any walleye fist fights, have you? No, not yet. <laughs> Everybody's been pretty respectful of one another, which is which is awesome because we do have a, quite a people that come out and um, thankfully people get along and and uh, that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yep. It, it, it white bass still a big thing? Is that still a big draw on the wolf? Yeah, it is. Um, it is a pretty big draw. We have... A lot of people that come up for white bass fish, fishing, and we have obviously a lot of local people that fish it too, but we have a lot of people that come um, from different parts um, of the state and even um, different states just to come uh, fish white bass. So it is a really popular fishery, and um, it's it's uh, always a, a good time of the year for it too. You know, the weather kind of starts to warm up and um, gets people out of the house and gets people on the water recreating, so it's always neat to see. Yeah. Talking about sturgeon a little bit, is that is it like that throughout all of Wisconsin? There's no, like, hook and line sturgeon season in anywhere Wisconsin? Yeah, there's um there's a few spots where they actually do have a hook and line season. Okay. Um, but at least the Winnebago system or the Wolf River, um, we have our sturgeon spearing season, which occurs in February on the ice, but um, there isn't actually an open season for hook and line fishing on the Wolf River. But um, there is a few spots in the state where you can actually fish and line hook or hook and line fish them. So we just happen to be one of the spots that um, that they don't have a season for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I know one of my friends gets into that, and I can't remember. I think he does it on the. I think it's on the Michigan side. Okay. Um, in Menominee, I th- I think he goes, but I I can't remember. But he does. He, he has a buddy that he does a trip every year with and does hook and line sturgeon. Sure. Yeah, that's a. I mean that's a super unique fish. That's uh, yeah. just dinosaurs, man. They're yeah. You look wild. at yeah. You look at some of the um, some of the data from those fish that you know are four or five feet long, and those fish are you know over a hundred years old. Um, when you mention dinosaur, they they true truly are a dinosaur, and um, they're such a unique and cool fish um, mm-hmm. that we have right here in our backyard. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Is that, uh, it, I'm trying to think, how does that work with your territory? Uh, sturgeon spearing, is that something you cover? Yeah, so um, sturgeon spearing actually showed occurs on Lake Winnebago and Lake Poygan. Yeah. Um, so I don't specifically cover those areas, but since it is such an increase, such an increased um, amount of people out there, generally I do go down to the opener and help out, and then um, I may head down there during the week too um, just to help out have some extra folks down so um it's not technically my assigned area but um part of our team covers it so i do head down there on certain times and and help out with it so yeah so i do get the get the fun to go down there yeah that makes sense i mean you probably have to uh, you know you go where it's needed right you have your geographic area but hey if you got to drive an extra hour to help somewhere busy busy right yeah yeah exactly and and uh, we kind of talked a little bit earlier about kind of administrative areas but we also have warden teams so there's um 
Green Lake County, Marquette County, Washera, and Wapaka. So we have four four counties that are within my team. So um, a lot of time, like, if the warden, say, down in Green Lake County has something going on or a, a big event and he na- needs extra hands, um, I'll go help people within my team. So a lot of my time is spent in Wapaka County, but there are times where I may go help with um, different work-related items when needed, which is kind of neat too to experience some different different areas of the state and and uh, whatnot. So, um, it's pretty unique. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, how much of your time would you say are you in the field? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, it really just kind of depends. Um, it kind of a lot of different variables. I'd say I'm out in the field a pretty good chunk of time, but, you know, along with that comes, um, of course, the not-so-fun part of paperwork. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have different trainings we have to do to keep up um, and be proficient in our jobs. So there's a lot of different things that come along with um, the field stuff, which is, of course, the most fun stuff. But it varies. Um, It just it depends on the time of the year, like especially like right now with a walleye fish run going on. Um... I'm extremely busy, and right now I'd say I spend a very significant amount of time in the field. And then, of course, you know, there's always the paperwork stuff you got to do along with it. Um, and then there's other times of the year where maybe I, you know, I may be working a little bit more um, on office type stuff um, and like some, you know, other things we may may deal with that require spending more time on the computer to kind of put together things. Um, and that may be done, you know on a rainy or crummy day, um, and then, you know, say, like, tomorrow would be really nice and warm, then I'd focus my time on being in the field. So I try to I try to plan my um, office-type tasks around weather if I can. Mm-hmm. Um, so if it's going to be um, rainy, stormy, I try to shuffle my day's tasks if I can just so I can maximize my time I spend out in the field, um, which is the fun part, and I think where um, – people like to see us as obviously in the field. So try to try to make it work out the best I can, but it's hard for me to put a number on it just because it, it just varies depending on the time of year. And, you know, even like your complaints or calls you get um, may dictate your work schedule and kind of how you work your hours um, of the day. So that also drives kind of the amount of time you're in the field. So a lot of variables. <laughs> yeah, it, well, it's kind of nice because it's probably, that it, that's like a good for the goose, good for the gander situation. Right. Like, you want to be outside on the nice days because there's there are going to be more people right out on the nice days. That's yep. just by de facto, right? You know exactly. And I've been <laughs> been out in my fair share of crappy days because, of course, <laughs> you know when it's twenty degrees and snowing, uh, some people still like to go catch fish. So, so I've spent my uh, fair share too of uh, being outside and not the nicest weather. But uh, I'm sure anybody could agree the nicer weather is always always more fun and enjoyable to be out in. But um, I do spend a lot of time in. Not so, not so fun weather and cold and rainy conditions and things like that too. But yeah, comes with the territory, right? At least you knew that going in. I did, yeah, yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, uh, we get a lot of um, they give us good gear to help keep us warm, and so we have have good good gear and, and tools we have to use too to kind of help keep us, you know, when we have to work in those situations or or extreme elements. So yeah. Was there was there anything surprising? You've done it for a while now. Is there anything surprising in the role that you didn't expect going in that you either you like or dislike? You know what I mean? It's just something that you wouldn't expect uh, or that you didn't expect before you became a warden. Yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, not maybe necessarily surprising because um, I kind of had a, like I mentioned before, kind of had a pretty good um, – with working part-time and then having my internship, I kind of had a, pr- a pretty good mm-hmm. idea of what I was getting myself into going into it um, and having that ability to work through my internship um, with wardens and then, of course, um, part-time. I did a lot of stuff on my own, but I did have the ability to work with um, with wardens as well. So I had a pretty good idea of what I was getting myself into. Um, so I can't really think of anything that um, I would say is surprising um, – but overall, I think um, I had a pretty good idea and um, I'd say like most things about my job, you know, yeah, I think any job you could probably pick the things you don't like. Oh, yeah. Um, for me, 
paperwork and being on the computer is probably my least favorite thing, but um, it's a necessary part of the job and yep. and whatnot. So, um, but nothing really surprising I can think off the top of my head. Um, that probably resonates with the across the department. I'm guessing you probably meet up with other wardens, you, right? You both grumble about paperwork. You don't want to. Yeah, do that. nobody wants. Yeah, it. exactly. Everybody <laughs> likes being out in the field and yeah. and uh, and you know catching poachers and and you know that's what we got into this job for is is to make sure people are following the rules and then of course all the fun community stuff outside of it too so but the paperwork aspect is probably the least enjoyable but fortunately like I said most of my time is spent working in the field so yeah. um, I enjoy that part of it yeah I don't know what uh, I, I don't know what what you can and can't even talk about but uh, I mean you have to have some wild stories of, <laughs> you, I heard poachers there you have to have some wild stories about poachers yeah yeah we have I could probably talk your ears off for days on on different stories, but just, you know, ranging from, we obviously deal with, you know, a lot of different elements ranging from, you know, fishing type violations to deer hunting violations. So, you know, there's a whole gamut of things, you know, from people doing things like shining and shooting deer um, at night with a spotlight. Um, That's a pretty, I think, egregious, egregious thing, Um, you know, down to, you know, hunting deer without a license, um, you know, hunting deer illegally over bait, things like that. So we kind of have a wide gamut of things we, um, we deal with. And along with that comes a lot of, a lot of stories and, you know, same with the fishing element of it. Um, for me on the Wolf River, a lot of the, um, probably most thing I run into is this time of the year, the walleye overbagging, people taking and keeping too many fish. You know, they go out in the morning, fishing's really good and, you know, they, whatever, have the day off or have the afternoon off, and then they end up going out a second time and, and catching another um, limit of walleyes. So right now that's really kind of the um, focus I've been dealing with is um, the overbagging on the Wolf River. And then, you know, of course you got the different things too that span throughout the seasons. You know, we talked about flathead fishing and, you know, people keeping too many or the wrong size of flatheads. Um, so there's kind of a wide variety of uh things that I get to deal with, um, based on, you know, the seasons and the time of year. So it, it definitely, yeah, keeps it interesting. And I (laughs) could talk your ear off with stories, um, over the years of doing it, but yeah, it's just a wide, wide gamut of things we, we work on. So I love that you still say it's something you get to do though. That's words are powerful and you still say you get to do it. I mean, that's exciting. Yup. Yeah. No, I would say, you know, the, the fun part about this job is, um, the variety to, to it. Um, you know, you look at what we do and, you know, the different, I always say the changing of the seasons. So like, you know, right now is really big emphasis on fishing um, in my station. And then, you know, a couple of weeks coming up, uh, add the turkey hunting enforcement to it and the turkey hunting element. And then, you know, then we change to more of the summer. So it's the summer fishing, um, boating enforcement. And then once you kind of get, uh, you know, a couple, two, three months of that, now the season changes again, and now it's deer hunting, um, your upland bird hunting, and then we go through that, and then it changes again, and now you have your winter, your ice fishing, snowmobiling, um, you know, different commercial activities. So it's kind of nice. So like, if you start to get kind of sick of something, um, usually the change is coming right right behind it. So it's it's kind of nice, um, the variety. And, and um, I think I mentioned earlier, maybe before we were on air, um, the hours, you know, there's, for the most part, um, I make my schedule based on, you know, what I have going on, my complaints. So I really have like an opportunity to work a bunch of different hours. And, you know, sometimes I may work, I may work eight to four. Um, some days I might start at two o'clock in the after afternoon and work till 10 o'clock. You know, sometimes I may start at eight o'clock at night and work till into the next morning, um, you know, depending on complaints. So, Um, there really is kind of a lot of flexibility with this job and, um, it's kind of a unique, um, kind of a unique career in the sense that, um, I pretty much run my station. So, um, you know, all the complaints come into me if, you know, say somebody's catching too many walleyes or somebody catch a, caught and kept a short fish, like all that comes through me and, and I set up, you know, my hours and how I'm going to work those type of complaints. So, um, it's really kind of unique where obviously I have a supervisor and I report to my supervisor, but I kind of, you know, based on my complaints, I'm kind of my own supervisor as well, because I, I pick what I'm going to do for the day. Like, 
you know, I'm not sure what I'm going to do yet tomorrow. Maybe I'm going to put a boat on the river. You know, maybe when I get out of here, maybe I'm going to have a complaint. I have to work. So um, a lot of what I do is kind of dictated around calls and um, and things and whatnot. So it's, it's kind of unique. Um, yeah. You really get to um, pick and choose what you do for the day. And obviously there's things that you, that are set in stone that you have to go to, trainings and things like that. Um, but it's really kind of a unique career, I think, in that sense where um, – you really kind of make your own schedule based on things that are going going on in your station, which is neat. And, you know, I've been in New London for 10 years, so I have a pretty good, you know, just because I've been there so long, I kind of I kind of know when my busy times are, and I kind of, you know, it's just I've been through 10 seasons of it. And, you know, so it's like, okay, now we're coming up to boating. Um, now we do the go through that and so it's it's pretty unique yeah so, keeps it fresh yeah it does it's yeah that's the that's the nice part about it you never you never really get stuck in a rut I always find myself um fi- finding something different to do and um it's it's nice yeah it's always there's something fresh and you can kind of pick and choose what you want to do too so yeah thinking about those violation types so something I, I love hunting I, I love bow hunting and and you hear stories from you know quote unquote the old days of when people would do that like i heard you say you know shining a spotlight and shooting deer at night Mm -hmm. you hear things about but like i can't i can't fathom like i like i've never i don't think i've ever met anybody that recently that does that you know like you hear stories about it back in the day but that's that's like something you run into is it like, like a yearly thing a daily thing like that happens yeah it does um people still do that um they still spotlight deer and shine them at night and and shoot them out of vehicles and things like that. So it is, uh, it's uh, kind of a continual thing. I would say probably since I've been here, at least one, one or two of those every year. Um, so not necessarily like a daily or weekly thing, but um, you know, some years you might get more calls or complaints than others, and then the next year you might get one or two. So it just kind of depends. Um, yeah. It varies from year to year for whatever reason. Still a couple of years, like it's it's wild to think about, you right? Because I know I remember when I was young, when I was in you know I early early teens, uh, I remember like uh, seeing like news stories about like the robo buck, you know, like yeah. they put the like like is that still a thing? Like yeah. you put the fake deer out and people shoot it and stuff. Y- yeah, we have um, yeah decoys that we use um, to address complaints. So yeah, people we still use them and people still shoot them. <laughs> So how silly could you be? Yeah, it's it's interesting. That's for sure. Um, yeah. It's definitely interesting. <laughs> yeah. So I want to talk about that part of your job a little bit because that that's probably the the heavier part, right? When you have to, there, I'm sure there are tense situations, dangerous situations, mm-hmm. um, heated situations, all of that stuff. Is that? what you expected when you got on the roll? What's that, what's that stuff like? Uh, the heightened emotions, the, the tense situations. Um, right. uh, how, how do you navigate that part of your work? Yeah. So like I mentioned before, knew that, knew that I was getting into that and there's a possibility for that. Um, emotions can be high, um, especially, you know, when it comes to um, fishing game things, obviously people are passionate about, about those things. And, um, for me, um, through this job, we get a lot of different training. Um, you know, when I first got hired, we go through a pretty um, long training portion. And, you know, as I progress in my career, we continue to refresh those trainings. And so we get a lot of really good training on how to deal those deal with those situations when things may be tense um, or intense or people are frustrated or upset with the situation. Um, so we get a lot of really good training on how to um, work through those situations. So for me, um, when I do get into a situation like that, I just I rely on my training um, to work through it. And um, I can say, fortunately, um, I would say 99.9% of the people I work with and deal with um, are all really good and not um, and not upset or in a, you know, in a intense situation I guess um even if they're breaking the law it's like oh shucks right. you caught me type deal yeah yep yeah. I think um it's a lot of people kind of you know understand you know they may not like being in that situation you know say they committed a violation and now they're having to be talked to by a warden or me um but I think people are pretty understanding that hey obviously I have a job to do and now we're here in this situation and you know we're going to work through it 
Um, so I think people understand that, you know, I have a job to do and, and I have to deal with the situation that's at, that's at hand. So, but once again, just in those situations, if I do find myself um, in that kind of situation, rely on my training to, to work through those, through those um, situations. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah you, you know, it's like you said, it comes with the territory and, it, you know, it's bound to happen at some point or right. another. Yep. And if someone's, I mean, if someone's shooting deer out of a window of a vehicle at midnight with a spotlight, <laughs> like they're probably, you know, they might get, <laughs> you know, they might get a little heated. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. It always could. That's yeah. for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's awesome. Um, like what thinking about your early career well like your first couple years uh as a as a warden um what uh, like for someone that you, you said you have a hiring thing coming up where there's going to be some new ones entering into the pool mm-hmm. what um what do you wish you knew as in as a warden when you were starting that you now know what do you wish you knew at that time um that's a good question. Um, ooh, I gotta think on this one for a second. Um, so it's kind of interesting because um, you know when you get hired, and you know you're really um, gung ho like it's a new job. Um, you know you're you want to hit the ground running and really work hard and. So for me, um, you know, I'm 12 years into this job now, full time. And it's kind of interesting because, you know, you think of people in their careers and, you know, you kind of go along and sometimes you kind of lose the passion for things that, um, you know, not that you don't like work, but you just kind of lose it because you've been doing it for a while. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say the opposite. Um, I still have a passion for the job. I still, still really love what I do. And I would say... I still have, if you want to call it the fire, when I first got hired. And um, I don't think I would have ever, like, guessed that. And maybe I never really thought thought it, thought it out, too. Mm-hmm. But even just, like, the other thing, how quickly um, the years fly by. Like, I look back, and it's like, wow, I've been doing this for 12 years. Um, you know, I'm not quite to the halfway point of my career, but pretty darn close. And... Um, you know, it's like, boy, the first 12 years just flew by. And it's like, you know, the next ones are probably going to go just as just as quickly. Um, but um, so I'd say probably that. I don't know if that was a surprise, but um, I still am passionate and, and really enjoy um, my work day in and day out. And, and I think that's a, I think that's a, a good thing. Um, yeah. You know, if you like what you do, nobody wants to have a job where they're not, you know, happy or um, don't enjoy going to work and I still enjoy getting up and going to work every day and um, and whatnot so I think you know not that that's a surprise because I think I would have you know I never looked at that when I was first starting out but um, you know you kind of compare it to other people and and um, where they're at in careers in their lives and and whatnot and I still really enjoy what I do and hopefully the next next 10 years or 12 years whatever I've left uh go by quick and I I think it's going to fly and before I know it I'll be looking at retirement so (laughs) (laughs) yeah is that is that where you see yourself Uh, like I don't know what the I don't know what like the hierarchical structure is of being a a conservation officer but um yeah for I mean first things first 14 years into a gig if you're still digging it right that's a good thing you're winning for a lot of people you're winning but like um what what's the is it like are there, I'm sure there are levels of your position, but then like, what, what's your, is your supervisor still a warden or is it something else? What does that look like? Yeah. So, um, we have, we have quite a, I guess, different levels of, um, I guess if you want to call it advancement opportunities. Um, so we have supervisors and all of our, um, supervisors or leadership staff are, um, wardens are credentialed. Um, Obviously, the f- the con- field conservation wardens were the, I guess, boots on the ground, if you want to call it, um, where that's our main task um, day in and day out is um, working in the field, following up with complaints where, um, like, a supervisor, um, they supervise a group of, uh, of wardens. So, like I mentioned earlier, we have four counties. So, my supervisor 
Uh, he supervises, I think there's six of us total in the four counties. And uh, so he gets out in the field and works um, with us on occasion, but he's not out in the field every day. He doesn't have an administrative area that he covers. Mm -hmm. So he's still a warden and still works in the field um, on occasion and, you know, helps with different events or, you know, if we have a group check or something or a big event coming up, he'll come out for that. And, and he pops in with us and he'll work a shift with us just to catch up and things like that. So um, all of our supervision are still um, wardens and credentialed staff and law enforcement officers, but based on their um, – work duties, they may not be out like us um, or have like a specific area they cover, but I know those folks try to get out when they can and work with their staff, which is really nice. Yeah. So does that, uh, does that appeal to you? Is that in your next 12 years or does the, the, the boots on the ground appeal more <laughs> that you dig it? Yeah, there? we'll see. Um, I really like where I'm at now. Um, I, I really do enjoy the field stuff and I, I really like it, but Sounds we'll like more paperwork. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> we'll see where we'll we'll see where the next few years bring me. But for now, I I really like the field stuff and I enjoy what I do. And you know, who knows? Maybe in a few years, I might want to take on a different role. And maybe I won't. Maybe I'll just like stick in where I am. We'll see. But yeah. for now, uh, that this is where I'm at and plan to stay. So yeah, nice. Yeah. So where where are your go to Wisconsin uh, bird spots? Where do you like to go here? Uh, northern Wisconsin or? Yeah, northern mm-hmm. Wisconsin. Yep. Um, I hunt a little bit up in the northeast, up in the northwest. I kind of have a few different places I go. So you don't have to give away your exact. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Nobody wants to give away their hunting spots. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I uh, mainly northern Wisconsin, northeast and northwest. Um, there's fortunately um, a lot of ground. Um, in the northern part of the state, you know, ranging from Minnesota on, all the, on over to the border there in Michigan. And um, fortunately, we have a lot of opportunities and um, definitely a lot of public lands um, in that in those neighborhoods, which is which is nice. So, yeah, I never knew until I until I lived up that direction. I never knew about the the cyclical uh, population numbers of grouse specifically. Oh, yeah, sure. I never knew that. Super interesting. That's probably, being a bird hunter, that's probably something you get into a lot, right? Yeah, it is definitely interesting. Um, that's for sure. And it's kind of always interesting, too, like when they say we're on a down cycle to just kind of like compare, um, you know, years past on, oh, does it seem like a down cycle? Does it not seem like a down cycle? So it's kind of always just interesting to pair that compare that cycle just to what I'm seeing the see if it matches up or not and um so it's yeah it's definitely interesting with the grouse yeah i was surprised when when we came back to the green bay area and i started uh deer hunting locally around here again i i see i don't know if it's just my chunk of land but i see plenty of grouse around here too and i never really expected that coming i don't think it used to be like that yeah that i remember anyway there seems to be pockets of them um around this area and even as you scooch kind of west um, there definitely is pockets of grouse. Um, I wouldn't say I see them everywhere, but pockets. Yeah, I so don't think it does, we're going to fill hotels or anything. Yeah, them, no, <laughs> no, I don't think so either. But yeah, it, what you're telling me, that does not surprise me if you got a, a spot with grouse in yeah. this neighborhood. This, this last bow season, I had one every night. Every night would come in at the time, like right, right before dusk, you know, like all animals move at that time. But like yep. have one come in every night that would get me excited because they, they do a, like – Everyone says squirrels. I think grouse do a very good job of sounding like a deer. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> they sure the do. <laughs> and, uh, man, five, six times this year, uh, a little grouse would come waddling in, and it, it must have had its – I don't even know where grouse – the grouse do. They sleep in a nest? What do they do? When, I think they tree roost. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, probably. So whatever he was doing, but walking by every night, several times I thought it was a deer coming in. Right, and then in the winter they burrow into the snow. Okay. Yep. So winter they burrow in, nice weather they roost in trees. I think so. Okay, <laughs> isn't that that's kind of wild? You you can I, I mean I've hunted them, you've hunted them a lot, right? And it's, but it's weird that you, it's an animal you don't have to know that about to hunt successfully. Right. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Like I know um, with that the snow roosting, um, the more snow I think for them in the better or in the winter is better um, yep. for whatever reason. So yeah, yeah. I remember hearing that that that's part of the cyclical thing, right? Is a, a hard winter for them is not much snow because they can't right. get out of the elements as good. Yeah, and, and this that. year I don't think they had too much snow up north, from what I hear. So yeah. it'll be kind of interesting to see how that 
how that affects them in the cycle. Yeah. Well, maybe it's the year that you end up driving west in the fall. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not opposed to that. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you taking some time to chat with us. It was nice yeah. to learn about it and uh, kind of hear about your day to day. We, we come into contact with wardens all the time, you know, whether they're checking our license or whatever, but I, I think uh, a little bit deeper look is really uh, in, enjoyable, especially for y'all since you're going to be hiring a few more. What's it, yeah. what's it like? Is it um, like, are, are there people banging down the doors to be conservation wardens or is it, are, are you got to pull people in? What, what's it like? Yeah, we, um, we have a pretty good uh, amount of candidates that we get to apply um, every year. Um, we've had, I mean, it can range from anywhere from 600 to up to like 900 to a thousand people. Um, it kind of depends on the year. So we have a pretty good application, um, applicant pool. Um, it's a pretty competitive process. Um, so for anybody who's interested, um, we are going to be opening our hiring process here on April 11th and that'll run through May 7th, um, if you uh, have an interest in the career or something interested you today that I talked about, um, check it out. We have a Wisconsin um, Warden recruitment website where folks can go on and um, they can learn more about the job, um, the ins and outs, kind of the training process, um, the hiring process. There's some really good information on there. Um, just Google Wisconsin DNR Warden recruitment and it'll take you right to that site. And um, if folks your listeners have an interest in the career. Um, there's some different links to recruiters um, that they can contact and ask questions. And I'm actually one of the wardens on our recruitment committee. So um, folks are able to reach out to me. My contact information is on the site. Or if there's a warden that's closer to them, they're welcome to reach out to those too. So um, we're always happy to answer questions for folks um, so they have the most information about the career and if it's something they're interested in. So Yeah. Are there other backgrounds that fit other than like criminal justice? Are there other backgrounds that fit transitioning to being a warden? Yeah. So um, we hire folks from all different backgrounds. Um, some, pe- some people get degrees in like natural resources management or different natural resources background. Um, we have hired people that don't have Um, a degree in law enforcement or natural resources and they you know they come to us from a different walk of life and have a uh, career path or a degree in something different so ultimately there's like an academy right that you end up going through anyway yep yeah so we provided that a lot of that training so what we look for is um folks that um you know have a passion for the job you know have those skill sets we're looking for and we provide the training so if you get hired on to us without, you know, a law enforcement degree or background. Um, we provide that training for folks to go through and, and it's kind of nice. So we, you know, we'll, we'll hire a wide variety of different, different people. Um, we just look for skill sets and people that are passionate about, you know, pre- protecting the natural resource and, and people in the outdoors is, is what we look for. So, um, we always encourage if somebody has an interest in a career change or, Um, you know, even, even, uh, people coming out of college, um, we look for people from all different, all different backgrounds and, um, and encourage people to apply if they're interested. Yeah. And, uh, you, you had mentioned your geographic journey earlier, starting in Milwaukee County and then moving up. Uh, That's kind of, that's kind of the norm for the gig, right? I I remember I used to host a a radio show, an outdoors driven radio show at at a different place and time in my life. And, uh, um, my co-host had a uh, rental cabin that a new warden was staying in. Okay. And he was in the area. I think it was like his first training part. So he okay. was there for like six months or something and then going to a different part. Sure. And that's kind of the norm, right? Then you get your first spot that you go to a while and then you probably sign that spot of the place in Wisconsin you ultimately want to be or see yourself, right? Yeah, for sure. So um, how our process works, if you... If you make it through and you're successful through the process, um, when you get your conditional job offer, um, they give you a warden station. So you know where you're going to go before um, you begin training. So you can make a decision if that's, you know, some folks aren't, you know, don't have the ability or don't want to move to different areas. So they may not have an interest in what's open. But um, when you get hired, you get that station. And then so you go there and then there's the ability to transfer. So say you get stationed in... I don't know, Brown County, since we're here, we'll use Brown mm-hmm. County. Say you get initially stationed in Brown County, and but you have uh, interest in going to another area of the state, 
Um, there's always an opportunity in the future for people to transfer and get closer maybe to where they want to be or into those stations. Um, like we mentioned, we were talking about different career advancements. We always have different, you know, movements. So it always seems like folks are, you know, either moving or transferring or maybe promoting or taking different positions. Um, so there's, it seems like there's a lot of opportunity for people to get to a spot um, where they would want to go if, if they can't get that spot initially, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, awesome, Caitlin. Thanks again for yeah. coming in. Thanks for chatting. having me. Absolutely. It was, uh, it was great to learn more. Um, I, uh, it, it's something that's, it's a, it's a, it's a role that draws you in, right there. Uh, it's part of, uh, you know, it's our, it's our gig sharing Wisconsin culture, right. And mm-hmm. hunting in the outdoors is, is central to that, to, to me and to a lot of people. And I think, uh, anytime you can, you know, try to start to align some passions with, with what you do on a day to day, you're it's start to the road to a, a happy, you know, enjoyable life. Right. So right. If there's a path there, it's awesome to hear about, uh, you know, the day-to-day and, and kind of how you can do it. So I appreciate you spending some time with us. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. Absolutely. It's good to chat with you. Yeah.